We will be starting in five minutes. How was lunch, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. No dessert. Is this two days in a row with no dessert? Okay. Here, here's a tip. If you order the kosher meal, they bring it, you know, especially wrapped from a local kosher restaurant. It includes dessert. I yesterday the person sitting next to me, yeah, he unwrapped it and it was like this chocolate cake, and I was like, man, how do you convert? Just for chocolate cake. I've converted for less, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, wow. You've just summarized like my whole world view of religions. <laughs> oh. Two minutes. It's true. So... But if you notice, the printed version has two slides per page. Because I'm all about the environment. We got less than one minute. You can feel the excitement. I like to start exactly on time. What? Are we going to talk about factories and iterators and singletons? Nope. 30 seconds. If you're synced to the same NTP server as I am, <laughs> you'll get a 10 second countdown. 20 seconds. <clears throat> Last call, bathroom breaks, anything? Remember, you can change tutorials if you're not happy anytime before the first break. Five, six, five, four, three, two. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Design Patterns for System Administrators. My name is Tom Limoncelli, and I'll be your tour guide for the rest of the afternoon. Um, this has uh, material from these two books, 
Um, this is sort of new. The second edition just came out a year or two ago. Feels like yesterday. Um, uh, updated and revised, which is publishing speak for, we added three chapters. And um, so I've taught a lot of tutorials here at, uh, at Lisa. And um, this is a new tutorial. Haven't taught it before. I uh, was talking with Usenix and they said, what would you like to teach this time? And I said, well, I, I think I've said everything I have to say. And they said, no, no, we want something new. And I said, well, what can I do? I, I said, I know. How about I just sort of like open my brain and just say like a hundred interesting, weird things that um, I found useful. And they said, OK, but you have to give it a title that doesn't involve cutting your brain open. <laughs> Maybe that would have gotten bigger turnout. <laughs> Who knows? Because it would have been like a Halloween theme, right? Like zombie system administration, brains. <laughs> Which reminds me, is anyone live blogging this? OK. Because I don't understand the term live blogging. Because if you're live blogging now, is all your other blogging like you know, undead blogging? <laughs> but anyway, so. Um, so instead of being totally random, I gave it a name. I called it Design Patterns. Here's, uh, I categorized them. I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but um, the slides are pretty complete and you all have PDFs. Uh, who, who am I? Um, so uh, I've been a sysadmin since 88. Um, I've worked at large and small companies. Um, I don't usually pitch books, but um, you know, this is just the perfect time to think about Christmas gifts. And what geek doesn't need the complete April Fool's RFCs? Sure, they're all available for downloading for free, but you have this on your like coffee table or you know your table at work. And and what we like to say our sales pitch for that book is, when your network is down, this book won't help you at all. <laughs> so um, so what the heck is a design pattern? Um, Design pattern. So a design pattern is a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem. Um, it's hard to teach system administration. I mean, it's, you can teach, like, if it's a specific topic, like backups using Legato Networker. You can teach that easily. But what about, you know, like the broader view of system administration? That's sort of hard to teach because there's what linguists call tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is the knowledge that you can only get from actually having done the task. So what turns a junior sysadmin into a senior sysadmin or an entry-level sysadmin into a junior sysadmin is, is that tacit knowledge. And it's hard to communicate tacit knowledge without actually you know, bringing you to you know, my office and saying, here, do my job for the day. Um, but design patterns is an attempt to uh, record the tacit knowledge. So, free chair over there. <laughs> when when Jaybar and I worked together, I would always wear a brightly colored shirt so he could. Oh. Mm. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so a generally reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem. And the concept of design patterns comes from um, actually the architecture industry. In the 80s, um, Christopher Alexander and a number of other people wrote this book called A Pattern Language, actually three books um, about architecture. Um, and one of them defined this pattern language. Um, it's not just for how to build things, but um, how to plan and the theory behind architecture. So. And their book went from the highest level of, you know, let's start out with you have the planet, and the planet's divided into countries, and countries are designed into, divided into cities, and here's the, what works well for good density of cities, and down to cities to towns to streets, and how's it, and you get like halfway into the book, and you're finally designing actual buildings, and um, so it's really more like civic engineering. Um, and towards the end of the book, it's like patterns for, well, this is what makes a good living room. Um, they should be about this size. You do want sunlight. You don't want this. Um, and then, like infrastructure, like you know, heating ducts and electric um, work. 
um, and patterns for all these different things in the theory that this is what he knows from being an architect for decades. And how can he convey this efficiently to new people? Well, that don't have that tacit knowledge. Um, he put it all in terms of, of these various patterns. Um, and in fact, if you don't know anything about architecture, but were stranded on a desert island and had to build a, I don't know, a resort, you could take this book and sort of amateurishly link up the patterns and put them together, and you'd actually come up with something pretty reasonable. So um, that has been applied, the pattern language concept has been applied to other industries, um, many industries in fact. Um, it's very popular right now in the programming community um, where, you know, yes, in C++ we can do uh, a myriad of different ways, or there are a myriad of different ways of, to do something, but experienced C++ programmers tend to do it this way. That's a pattern that is worth repeating. Um, why? Well, it's through experience and tacit knowledge that's the best way to do it. So what does a pattern have? Pattern tends to tend to have four thing, four important things and a lot of minor things. The important things are a really cool name, um, a description of so what is the pattern, uh, criteria about when to use it, and anecdotes um, that sort of drive the story home. Anecdotes are particularly important because system administration, in addition to being a career, is very much a culture. And cultures pass knowledge to future generations through their stories and, and anecdotes. Um, and it's important that we, as a culture, therefore, collect our stories and pass them down. You looking for a seat? OK, excellent. Um, but in addition, you can also document you know, related patterns, sort of you know, precursor you know, parent and child patterns, um, advantages, disadvantages, tips. Um, research that supports, you know, it's not just it feels good, but here's some research that supports it. Um, if we had all day, I would have all four, five, six, seven elements of this for every single pattern, but, um, I, but I don't. Because <laughs> this is sort of opening my brain and, and scooping out bits of useful information. Um, and now, as system administrators, we do have patterns uh, all over the place that we do use, the goal of this talk is to extend that and encourage the creation of, of new patterns. So for example, uh, RAID 0 is a pattern. Um, and if me and this person were talking about RAID 0, um, or the, the, I've, so I've designed a server. Um, the boot disk is RAID 0. Um, it's with another server that's active, active configuration. Um, and he, in two sentences, he basically understands the architecture because we have this common language. If we didn't have the term RAID 0 and we didn't have the term active, active um, servers, it might take a half an hour to explain that. In a perfect world, five to 10 years from now, we have, as an industry, as a culture, we have a whole bunch of these patterns with cool names and well-defined and research to back them up. And when you start a new job, when the economy comes back and you start a new job, you come in and instead of spending a month to understand the environment, someone just sits you down and says, oh, well, our architecture is you know, this client server uh, with blah, blah, blah. We have a two-tier help desk. When we do uh, rollout of new software, we're very strict about using the canary process, though we're allowed to use pillars and columns in these situations. And you're just like, wow, I understood what that meant and I'm ready to roll. And it would be so awesome. So, but using patterns is a choice. It's not like a law of physics. Law of physics, you know, in situation X, you know that only A can happen, and you know that B can't happen. Design patterns are different. Um, I buy a Dell server, and I know I can configure it an infinite number of ways, um, but only certain of those ways are going to be like, you know, reliable. <laughs> Or um, uh, so I have the choice to do it badly or do it well, or if there's a variety of good ways of doing something, I can do you know active passive failover or active active or load sharing um, uh, and 
Um, and so design patterns are different than laws of physics. It's a choice that we're making. So I could deploy all new software to everyone at once in a flash cut upgrade, or I could do it in stages, canarying. I'm making this choice. Um, I could try to support 15 different distros in my environment, or I could say, no, we're going to have a limited list of distros. Um, both of those perfectly possible, but one of those I would advocate is better. Um, the more disciplined approach of a, a limited number of, of uh, distros is going to keep me more sane. Um, and if we all start using these terms and management starts learning these terms, then management won't say, well, why can't we just support every version of Linux in the world? Well, well, boss, if you can afford it, we, we can do it. <laughs> okay, so enough introductory material. Uh, oh, actually some housekeeping. Um, uh, first of all, feel free to jump in with questions at any time, raise your hand or shout. I'm from New York, so really you don't need to raise your hand. I'm okay with just shouting out. Um, also, uh, I have a copy of the time management book and the new second edition of the Practice of System Network Administration uh, that I'm going to give out. I meant to give this one out in the morning session and forgot. So you guys are so lucky, <laughs> there'll be two prizes today. Um, and I don't, so the way we're going to give this out is uh, uh, probably the best question. Towards the end of the class, we'll maybe we'll vote or something. What was the best question or funniest anecdote? Um, and you'll get your choice. Um, questions, books, and, and let's go. Okay. So, uh, oh, questions about what I was saying about design patterns in general or comments? Yes. We're going to get to pillars and columns. And it's like chapter five of this book, I think. Um, the Googles were unhelpful. Um, try Bing. <laughs> this is being recorded. <laughs> oh, that's what I wanted to say. This is being recorded. If you need to ask a question that you don't want to appear on YouTube, <laughs> um, please we'll just tell us and we'll, we'll pause it, you know, especially if it's like you know, about your boss. <laughs> okay, so first category, let's talk about some upgrade techniques. Um, one sum or many, uh, one sum then many. So um, say we have to uh, you know, roll out uh, this is a technique for deploying new software or any kind of change, actually. So once some many refers to the fact that I'm going to uh, make sure that the upgrade works in one place, probably my workstation, and then some places, um, and then if that's successful, many places. So I might upgrade my workstation, then everyone in the system and team goes through the same upgrade, and that gives us the confidence to do it at many places. Um, some variations, you do this on, um, you know, uh, actually, so when I was at Bell Labs um, and my system and team maintained, uh, we had five user groups, five different labs within Bell Labs got their IT services from us. And some were more risk adverse and some were less risk adverse. So the less risk adverse were the first of the many and then we would expand from there. Um, there's a lot of tools. What, what tools do people use for doing their, their rollouts? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll suggest, so CF Engine is a popular tool. Uh, hmm? B Config, B -config uh, and, and Puppet. Those are the big three um, known as automated configuration management tools. Um, and which of them are do the best job of providing sort of a, a stage rollout, the one, some, or many? What? Whichever one you know best. I believe they can all do some kind of, of, of staged rollout. Um, I know that with uh, CF Engine, you sort of set a, a flag, like you might set certain users are in a, uh, the many group. Um, but actually, I use one some many, most of all, not in an automated way, but just in a, uh, uh, for things that can't be automated, like physical changes, uh, like a network, uh, often a, a network hardware change. Okay, so 
in the HPC or grid computing arena where you have hundreds or thousands of machines, um, canarying is used. Canarying is a variation of one sum or many. Um, where I work at Google, um, we do everything in a canarying uh, manner. So canarying comes from the term canary in a coal mine. Coal miners keep canaries with them because if there's poisonous gas, the canary will die. Uh, they're very sensitive to poisonous gas. They'll die much sooner than anyone else. So what we're going to do in this environment is we have thousands of machines all running the exact same software. Like um, you know, our web, they're all running web servers, for example. And so uh, uh, you know, Google.com um, is served by web servers and we're going to upgrade that web server. We do a canary, which means 1% of the web servers are upgraded. And then we watch the logs, and we make sure that people are still getting their service. Um, and then if that is successful, we start upgrading one web server per second until they've all been upgraded. And at any time in this process, if the canary dies, if our monitoring says, hey, queries are coming back you know, with a you know, 500 error, um, then we begin a rollback process. So um, the canarying technique usually implies having some automated rollback and, um, and a much larger uh, number of machines. Questions, comments? How long do you let run? It depends on which service. Um, you know, the, the guys that maintain the spell checker service are going to do something different than blog search or whatever. Um, I think the important thing is the ability to test between. So you might do, you might do one machine, um, send queries to it directly instead of to the load balancer so that you know it's going to the one machine um, and you either send um, automated tests or Maybe you just start simply with the web browser pointing to it, um, and you do some manual tests yourself. Then, um, then the one percent, um, and we have automated systems that send the same query to that one percent and to machines that aren't queer, uh, out, are not canary. Um, make sure they're getting the same results. Um, and at any of these points, it totally pauses and waits for a human to say, "Yes, we can go to the next stage." So there's a pause at, at 1, at 1%, one and then, uh, well, there's no pause for 1 per second. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, how many people, let, let me divide this group into enterprise, grid computing, or HPC, and uh, web services. How many people here are in the enterprise area? OK, um, grid or HPC? Okay, about the same, and uh, web services. Okay, and uh, none of the above? Or all, so we were talking about none of the above. Uh, one category, another category would be if web services is the infrastructure, then app services is a different kind of system administration. So the, the web services install, that sit on top of the web infrastructure, anyone? Okay, or both, all the above, not sure. <laughs> I thought this was the workshop on ZFS. <laughs> someday I'm going to, oh. Someday I'm going to just write a set of slides on a totally different topic and start presenting them and not stop until someone says, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> but I'll be sneaky about it. It'll be my time management class and the slides will be about the NTP protocol. <laughs> I must have misread the description. <laughs> but I've never known so much about NTP.conf. OK. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of upgrading. But let's talk about uh, not upgrading. Well, so I have a policy. I only want two releases in the field. Um, at, uh, two jobs ago, I was at a company. We made a, um, a little hardware appliance. and. The software for it, there was the, uh, it would have been crazy to try to support every software release we had ever given out to customers. So instead, we had the release that was supported and the release that people, um, the previous release that people should be moving up to. 
Um, and we actually had a small enough customer base that we had a policy where we didn't ship the new version until the last customer had been upgraded into the current version. Because we wanted to be very strictly release this um, two customers, uh, two versions in the field at any given time. Once we had more than five customers, we broke away from this. Um, but you know, on an enterprise level, I mean, how many people have uh, you know, a big Windows environment where you have more than three versions of Windows in your field? Like, yeah, like you still have some Windows 95 boxes out there, right? Like some secretary in the, you know, the smallest office in Ohio has a Windows 95 box. Um, so, um, especially in the enterprise when you're dealing with a lot of Windows versions or a lot of Linux uh, versions, you want to try to, in a managed environment, you want to, um, part of management is only two, field, two revs in the field at any given time. Um, so, one way of enforcing this in a software environment is the team that really wants to roll out release C is in charge of doing the deprecation of release A. And they can't ship C until A is completely gotten rid of. This puts the incentive in the right place. It also makes your developers appreciate the pain that your customers are going through. If there's a customer that says, no, I really can't leave release A because of this feature that we know is buggy in release C, then that inspires the team to, to fix the problem. It puts the people that need to feel the pain uh, equals the people that can fix the pain, which is an important incentive. Okay, Ratcheting. Um, ratcheting is a management technique. It, the name comes from the, the tool, a ratchet. If you think about a ratchet, they only turn one way. Um, uh, as you crank, it, it makes a motion that goes in one direction. So. <clears throat> Ratcheting is a pro. Oh, I hate to read my own slides, but um, it makes sure that a project only moves forward. So, for example, um, a friend of mine was at an e-commerce site, an, a particular auction website, which you might be familiar with. And um, uh, when they were very new, they were uh, this is early dot com. It was all Solaris, and um, machines were being broken into. Uh, faster than they could patch the machines. And so her company was called in to do some consulting and to clean up the, um, clean up the security problem. And they realized that there's no way they could patch faster than the new machines that are being broken into. So they came up with a auto install system that installed the machine and patched it before it had access to the internet. But even that wasn't helping because as it, um, Sysadmins were installing new machines using the old process. Um, and management had to lay the law down and say, no, everyone has to use the new process. And that was essentially ratcheting. They were saying, new machines are going to use the new process, and old machines were going to um, reinstall using the, the new process as, as fast as we can. Because anything else, we're losing ground on this problem. And uh, let's see. I guess I have some other areas. Oh, yeah. So ratcheting in personnel. You have a low-performing group, um, and you say, okay, so this happened. I came into a small company, um, very low-performing IT group, and I told my, my VP, I said, we need to only hire really top-notch people because we have to get this low-performing group out of, out of the hole that they're in. And she said, okay, but we need people fast, so why don't we take the best person we see this week? And I said, no, we're going to ratchet this. We're going to, even if it means it takes longer, we're only going to hire new people that are really top notch because we can't move backwards. Yes? Is it hard hiring uh, you know, the best people for a low-performing team? Is it hard hiring the best people into a low-performing team? Um, yes, though you can use the pitch of, uh, you know, you're going to be king of this island. Um, because we're hiring senior people that are, you know, um, that you know you're you're gonna you're gonna look great and help reform. It doesn't seem very 
Well, I, get, I spun it as this is your opportunity to, to build, your, build a new island and do great. And, uh, um, and the low performing people either uh, got the training they needed or left the company. Yep. Uh, oop, there we go. So there's also the slow ratchet. Um, any machine that comes, so all new machines will use our new imaging technique so that all, all new machines start out with the same image. Um, old machines, we're not gonna go out into, into the cubicle farm and force people to upgrade, but anytime they come to the help desk, they're gonna get re-imaged so that slowly over time we will re-image all new machines, or all, all, all machines will be re-imaged. Yes? Oh yeah. Oh, an excellent example. So when Canada introduced the dollar coin, new they only issued new dollar coins and any do, any paper money, paper dollars that came into a bank uh, dollars came in but they only came out as coins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and that relates to this last thing. It's important that the path of least resistance is the easiest thing to do. You want the lazy way to be aligned with what you want your users to do. So, um, you need to come up with a better meaning for the path of least resistance. There oh, are that's there. least resistance. So, Mark, slide 14. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, uh, so if people find popping in a CD-ROM and loading their own operating system easier than using your auto install system, there's something wrong. You've basically encouraged people to use the, the bad way. So, um, uh, or a better example is when I was at Bell Labs, um, everyone was buying it was so difficult to support our desktops because everyone was buying a different, um, different PC, different brands. We were maintaining spare parts for all these different crazy things. Um, and we said it would be so much better if everyone had the same PC, um, or at least maybe we changed models once a year instead of every new hire. Um, so we came up with a system. We, we realized that when people were ordering their own PC, it would take them up to six weeks to get it and have it be up and running. Um, so we said, as long as we're a lot faster than six weeks, people are gonna come to our standard solution. We couldn't, couldn't force people into our standard, so we just made a, a standard that was more convenient. So we had a, um, we, we pre-bought machines, pre-configured them, and they were ready to eat. If you needed a new machine, you could get it in, get it in an hour. It was like Domino's Pizza. Um, and as a result, even though people who had previously given all these excuses of why they didn't want to move to a standard machine configuration, um, they, you know, all those, all those excuses went away when they were told they could have a machine in one hour. Um, and in fact, a lot of their excuses also went away because they were saying, well, I want a special video card or this or that, the other thing. Um, we had, uh, the cost savings in buying machines in bulk meant we could get a video card that was better than the special video card that everyone wanted and stuff. So um, it, it really changed, it changed the culture. Uh, questions, comments? Yes? Yes, yeah, that's, that's also a good, good pattern. Yeah, so that's, um, Sam, I'm not good with coming up with the cool names, but the uncool name would be um, align the lazy path with the, the preferred path. Yeah. yeah no. Okay. So the death squad. No, find a better name. Um, so uh, this is what I was talking about before. The uh, you know the team that made C is responsible for deprecating, getting rid of uh, version A. Um, so we actually call this death squad. So uh, a company I worked at, 
uh, went through a process of moving from Red Hat to Ubuntu, and lots of different groups um, were, well, some groups were like, yay, and they converted very quickly, and some groups within the organization really dragged their feet. So eventually we formed this death squad, and the death squad went out and identified which machines were still running Red Hat and helped those groups do their conversion. Um, you know, helped them. Um, well, so as a project manager, so as a non-technical, well, a technical project manager, um, but more of an administrator type that could um, uh, do the communication and find out, so why haven't you converted? Oh, these three things aren't compatible. Okay, I will you know, file a bug for each of them, work the issue, work with those teams to make those bugs get resolved, and now you can do your upgrade. Um, and there were technical people that worked with the project manager that um, were able to answer questions and, and fix bugs, fix bugs f on behalf of the team um, if they weren't getting fixed fast enough. Um, so there's tools that the desk squad can use, the, the carrot and the stick. Carrot are the, you know, the nice things that you do to encourage people to do something, and the stick is the whack, um, the punishment for not doing the preferred thing. So the technical team, the desk squad provided conversion tools, uh, documentation and FAQs, um, political and financial assistance. So if you were doing your conversion, you had the backings of, of management to delay one project because you really have to get your conversion done. Um, they provided a test lab, a place, a real physical room that people could go and log in and show that uh, their apps didn't break under Ubuntu or find out where they did break. Um, and uh, compliance software. Uh, some sticks that were provided, um, a support deadline. You know, Red Hat asked, you have to be converted to Ubuntu by this certain date, um, and one week later is the support deadline. You know, we, if you, uh, we're not even doing security patches. Um, uh, edicts from CEOs. Um, oh, so other examples where this pattern is useful. If you've ever had to change your company's domain name, um, changing to a, a Windows uh, domain, uh, if you're a uh, Windows domain controller name for some reason has to change. Often, often everyone's like first dom Windows domain name is like domain or something. Or, or worst of all, it's it's the name of your company and then your company's name changes. Um, uh, or removing like transitioning from one major system to another. Like maybe you you have one centrally administered monitoring system that each team can sort of plug their rules into. Um, and you need to move to a different monitoring system, you would uh, um, have a death squad that are experts in how to use the, 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 the language of the old system and the language of the new system and help people do their conversions. Um, what's, uh, uh, does anyone have a big conversion on their plate right now that they're working through? Yes? Changing all your internal DNS names. It's been going on for four years. <laughs> so, are are you changing the domain name or the host name? Domain. The domain name, yeah, um, yeah. So one thing that the team could do is watch the uh, DNS logs, and uh, you know, put it into the mode that records every single DNS query, and then you could start making your list of who the desk squad has to come visit. Yeah, um, one thing they do at uh, IETF meetings now is during the whole week-long conference, there's one hour where they block IPv4, so people that are using IPv6 exclusively are the only people that can do anything on the network for an hour. And you'd be amazed at how many people discover they thought that they were pure IPv6, but their laptop doesn't work, or <laughs> their word processor doesn't work. How could that be? Um, so maybe you want to have like a, you know, every f Saturday at noon for one hour, you know, DNS you know, doesn't support the old domain or something. Um, so a more friendly technique is uh, trail guides and tire teams. So trail guides are people that come along on the journey with you to help you get to your destination, and tiger team um, 
aren't just there to help you along, but maybe are actually doing the work. So, um, uh, so for example, the um, the people that haven't converted their domain are probably afraid of what might happen if the conversion went wrong. But once you've done like five of these conversions, number six is pretty easy. So if your trail guides are the people that have done five of them, um, you know, or the, your if if it's like an Oracle site that doesn't want to move, um, someone who's done Oracle before, maybe they could you know, be the most helpful. Um, Tiger teams would actually do the work. So maybe uh, you'd give someone a, a week to sit with that group and actually get them converted. The risk with a Tiger team is it's when you do someone else's job, they didn't learn how to do it. So you may do their job for them for a week, leave, and then discover that at the next outage, they don't really know what to do because you've converted them to something that they don't understand yet. Questions, comments? Yes? The only thing, uh, another thing I find that happens a lot with the Tiger team, and that's where we get stuck in this boat a little bit myself, mm -hmm. is whenever you're working on something that's not, not well known, that, you know, maybe you've documented it, but, you know, for instance, I, I work on that. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm the only one who understands the networks enough to do changes. Whenever you have someone push something with a tiger team, it's sort of like extra things getting piled on your plate without much help in that case. That, you know, tiger team only can help 80% of people in the organization. Right. If you're on the tiger team for a week, you have to have, your boss has to take you off the projects you'd normally be doing that week and find other people to do that work. Less that and more that. Other people get carried along the fast tiger team timeline, mm -hmm. even if they aren't technically tiger. Kind of like you get latched to that timeline if you're uh, if you're supporting that sort of change. So their timeline becomes your timeline. Yes. Mm -hmm. What about the you touch it, you own it? Sure. Then there's certainly you touch it, you own it. Um, so a lot of your decision about which technique you're going to use here has to do with how fragile your environment is. If you have a very fragile environment, then you're, yeah, you touch it, you own it is, is sort of scary. It's like, yeah, you were the last, you. Um, so maybe one thing you want to do is first assess how fragile is this in the environment that I'm walking into and then decide your velocity, you know, how fast you're going to do these changes. Um, Maybe the expertise that you're bringing is more about the testing than actually both sides bring testing. You bring testing uh, of what the change has accomplished and they bring testing of what the service should be doing so that your before and after pictures look the same. I think more the example of whatever that you know, where mm -hmm. somebody puts something in place and nobody left actually understands how it works. So oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I was thinking more about blame, but just for the microphone. Um, so your point is that no one understands a certain system, but then you touch it, and all of a sudden you own it because your you, your ignorance is better than everyone else's blindness. <laughs> That's didn't come out right. Your you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, your, your minute experience is better than everyone else's total ignorance. There we go. You're the least clueful. You s yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that because uh, I was thinking you'd be you know, going to a group that does exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes? How do I feel about whips and pointy sticks? <laughs> We should pause. <laughs> well, that's a great segue on to the next thing, <laughs> which is what I'll be saying anytime I don't want to answer a question. Um, so, or whenever you pause. Or whenever I pause. Now that we're So, we're still rolling. Here, here, here's a pattern change tools between cycles. So, how many people here support uh, developers? or like CAD environments, these are environments where they're very centered around their tool. And if you change their compiler at a, 
in a surprising time, or if you surprise them with a compiler change or a new CAD tool change, that's bad. Um, the, uh, well, real world example, the a CAD team I used to work with, they, the version of the tool that they started with um, was supported by the CAD vendor until that chip was designed. And they might, the vendor could supply patches to fix bugs, but basically if they, were on version 7.1 of the software when they began the chip. The vendor had a commitment to support that tool chain until that chip shipped. And then the second rev of the chip might be when they'd go to 7.2 of the software, or 7.3, or 8.0. Um, I used to pride myself in providing to my users the absolute latest and greatest GCC. It would come out and bam, boom, the new one's in production. Yeah, what I didn't realize is <laughs> You know, they'd be a week away from shipping, and the testers would be like, wait a minute, all of our tests that used to work don't work anymore. Lemon jelly, you messed up our compiler. Um, so a more mature way of doing this is you put your tool chain changes in sync with your development. Um, okay, so it's just a more mature, more stable way of, of providing service, which, which often means that the, your tool chain um, especially development stacks are often um, uh, really more owned by the um, owned by the users of the stack than than the systemmins who just think of it as just part of the operating system okay um, another upgrading technique only roll forward so um, we push out package 100, then 101, then 102. There's a problem, so we roll back to release 101. That's one way of doing things. Another way is we push out release 100, 101, 102. There's a problem, so we clone release 101 and call the, this 103 and push out 103. Um, why, why do we do this differently? Um, this has certain benefits. Um, some systems get confused when they see an old version number. So for example, DNS zones, DNS zone numbers only increment. And now it's a 32-bit in, and so it can wrap, you know, go from zero to 32 and, and wrap around. Um, but DNS zone numbers only increment. And that solves a lot of problems because DNS servers are very loosely coupled and sort of, they're so independent that you can't communicate rollback. You can really only, and um, it's sort of like if you were communicating with people that lived 100 light years away, you have to uh, make sure that your question um, includes, you know, a, a default answer, right? Your default answer here is we're going to roll forward. If you're not sure what to do, Take the highest release. I had a, I saw a problem with this recently with a, an LDAP upgrade. They upgraded to new LDAP software, and uh, it had a bug, so they rolled back. And then there was some machine that had been powered off for a while, and um, when it got powered up, it looked around and saw these version numbers, and didn't know about the rollback, and it was running with the newer version and screwed up everyone else. Um, do I have examples? Oh, look, DNS, databases with release numbers. Um, which packaging, which Linux packaging systems have um, these numbers that are sort of package numbers as opposed to um, the version number of the version software inside? But di the, distribution. the distribution itself is often sort of the meta package. Um, I know a lot of homegrown package systems work like this. Okay. Uh, before we go on to the next chapter, qu questions, comments, rollbacks? I could roll back to a previous slide. <laughs> yes? Well, you don't always get to choose the version number. You don't always get to choose the version number, right. Right, if you're um, at GCC version you know, 5.1 and then you put out 5.2 and people say we need to roll back, you don't you can't call the GCC people and say, could you re-release it? Right, but what you can do is um, have some kind of meta package that um, is your own personal number, 100, 101, 102. And so the definition of a meta package is, is it includes 
these packages at the real version number. Um, if you have the source. Well, that's why it's important to keep your old packages. Yeah. At least until you've uh, deprecated it. Sure. Okay. So let's talk about making your point. Um, I find that uh, sysadmins often have trouble um, describing stuff to non-technical management. So here's a bit of advice. And it's a concept that... Uh, that I call undeniable value. Try to describe things in undeniable value. So when, when I was a young beginning sysadmin, I would do things like I'd go to my boss and say, boss, we should buy a new server. And he'd say, no. And I'd go away and say, wow, my boss just doesn't understand my brilliant idea of buying a new server. Well, my boss was, this has no value. Buy a new server or what? That just sounds like you're trying to spend money. But, if, but in my head, I had all these brilliant ideas of what a new server could do. Now, if instead, if I could take what I want to do with that server, and, and this is hard, and come up with what's the undeniable value of this server. Well, what I want to do with this server is I've noticed that our salespeople spend half of their day not calling customers, but fighting with this upload system where they have to retry and retry and retry. And why are they retrying? Because our server is too slow, and a new server would fix this. And so by by taking it at higher and higher levels of abstraction, I've gone from buy a new server to fix this technical problem to ser salespeople will have more time in their day to sell instead of fighting a broken system. So now I go to my boss and I say, boss, I have this great idea. Our salespeople are spending half of their day fighting with this upload system. I have a plan that will fix that. And now that's undeniable value. S salespeople spending their whole day selling instead of fighting technical problems. Well, what's my solution? Oh, we're going to buy a new server, and that, that gets approved. Or maybe I've come, maybe everyone's coming to my boss with different things, and he has only a certain amount of money. Maybe he's saying no, but he's saying no because maybe $5,000 for a new server has value to the sales group, but we're out of money or other things are higher priority, but at least now he's making decisions based on the, the, the value of things. Um, so it might be we're making um, the mail system serve uh, faster or um, you know, I want to automate Zen virtual machine creation. Uh, people, um, so what I do right now is I'm working on the, uh, an open source project called Gennetti, which is virtual system, virtual machine automation. And um, for the first part of the project, we always, had difficulty explaining, well, you know, we automate this and we put these open source packages together and it's great. And what we should have just said is it's great because that's the undeniable value. We can roll out a new virtual machine in one command and it takes, you know, an hour. Um, well, we, we press return and come back an hour and it's done as opposed to previously where it was 50 commands and didn't work half the time because of typos. Right. So, right. So the value to uh, to my boss might be um, I can set up virtual machines faster. The value to my users is they get uh, the same machine every time and it's r configured properly. So their their value is consistent service. So it's boss. I want to improve the consistency of the service we're providing. And sure. Right, yeah, if we can create and delete services faster, then we can you know, obsolete old operating systems. Sure. Any kind of repeatability is such a boon. Once, once you take a process that's chaotic and turn it into repeatable, then you have real opportunity to improve it. Um, and uh, actually, I'll tell you a funny story. Something I skipped in the morning, but I, we have time now. Um, so. The other day, I was in a restaurant, and um, it was a nice restaurant in Hell's Kitchen, New York, and I was noticing that the waitress was, um, I thought she'd be a great sysadmin, because she 
when she refilled the, the water glasses, she would take a pitcher of water and just hit like every table. And if you thought you needed water or not, she'd refill your water glass. As opposed to the restaurant I was at the day before, I was at a Friendly's. And if you've ever been to Friendly's, their business model is to hire high school kids that are having their first job ever and don't always know what they're doing. And what the waitress that night at Friendly's was doing is every time someone would ask for a glass of water, she would run, get the pitcher, and fill the glass, and then bring the pitcher back. So it was on demand, and she thought she was being very efficient. Someone asked for water. I got water. What's wrong? But now I'm at a restaurant where someone's walking around, and she's batching. So it's batch processing versus interrupt driven. And maybe I was asking for water more often. Maybe she was using more water than the first person, because the first person was the exact amount of water that was needed was dished out. And I was in the second restaurant getting, um, you know, I hadn't thought I needed water, but she's walking around, so she's probably giving out more water. Now, so you take something that's chaotic and interrupt-driven, and you turn it into something that's a, a batch process, that's better. Well, the next night, I'm at another restaurant, and I noticed that they had a totally different person that was doing the water. And I thought, wow, you know, once you take a chaotic process and make it regular, you've isolated the process, you can actually delegate it a lot easier. So our system and tasks, we, 